which is just a super popular fly, has been for decades, and uh, it was created by Lee Wolf. And I'm not going to tell you a lot more about it until the end of this video. Then I'll talk about how it's fished, where it's fished, when it's fished, um, and maybe a little about the history of the fly. But for now, let's just tie the fly, the Royal Wolf. First, of course, comes your hook. It's going to be typically a light wire hook. Um, Something like this one, which I really like. Uh, light wire, quite a range. I'm going to tie a size 10 this time so that it's real easy for you to see what I'm doing. And uh, I do like this hook because it's barbless, and barbless hooks come out of me a lot better than hooks with any kind of barb at all. And every once in a while, a hook goes into me. So that's why I like barbless. But that's a good choice. There are others. Your thread is going to be black. I really like a, an A dot for trout flies, you know, average size trout flies to actually quite small. Not for the real big ones, but uh, this is ADOT Unithread Black. Then we tie in the wings. Now the, sta the old standard for the wings was uh, often uh, bucktail. This is a bucktail and you would use the white, of course, or calf tail. This is a natural bucktail. Calf tail again, the white. This has a little bit of a, a little bit of a curl to it. Uh, it's a little, I don't know what to call it, kinky, wavy, something like that, which is not a bad thing. Um, and then a popular choice these days, and for some time now, has been calf body. It's a little easier to work with than calf tail because it's straighter, and the fibers tend to it seems like they tend to be the same size, length rather, uh, a little more consistently. But it's, it, the only limitation with calf body is it's not terribly long. So when you get into a size 10, that can be a little bit of a challenge to, uh, to make a wing. But for smaller ones, great. Then we get to the tail. Now, I'll go back to bucktail because that's my, my personal favorite choice. And uh, you would use, it's a brown tail and it's a hair tail, so I would use bucktail myself. This is natural brown bucktail. My problem is that I use so much brown bucktail, the natural brown, that like <laughs> I end up with a lot of these. And that's a, a bucktail where almost all the brown has been taken out of here, mined out of here, leaving me just a whole lot of white. And I use the brown at least as often as the white, and there's less of it, probably more. So what I finally started doing, so I wouldn't keep, wouldn't keep ending up with too much white and not enough brown, was to buy dyed brown bucktail. And uh, that works great. And it doesn't get that much darker in the center, but you know, you get a lot of brown. That's worked well for me. Now, the body is made in three sections. The first section is peacock curl, like this curl here. And you would use these fibers off the sides, which are called hurls. So this is a pe eyed peacock feather. Here's the eye. And uh, the eye actually, it identifies the feather, but the fibers you would use, the hurls that you would use would be below the eye. So from about here on down, those are great, but the eye feathers are not so great, eye hurls. Um, sometimes it comes on, you can buy it this way, or a lot of times you get it strung or just bunched up in bags, and that's fine too. We're also going to use floss, red floss. Now some people will use a very heavy red thread and for the first part of the fly, and that's how they, uh, how they get that red band that you'll soon see. But floss has this nice gloss, that floss gloss, <laughs> and uh, you're not going to get that with thread. Does it matter to the fish? Oh, I really doubt it, but, you know, we don't care that much, do we, about what the fish want? Not that I've noticed, fly fishers. Okay, and then you're going to need hackles. Now, I have a book uh, in which Lee Wolf, who created the Royal Wolf says dark brown hackle, but most of us use whatever we want. In fact, that goes for the whole fly. You know, there are a lot of ways to tie this fly and a lot of variations of materials, but I like a medium brown, just a rich brown hackle like this. I don't consider that dark brown. I could even go lighter. The point is a brown hackle, and it can either be a neck hackle 
or it can be a saddle hackle. Either one, just so long as they're a dry fly rooster hackle. <laughs> Let's do this. That's what it's supposed to look like when it's done. That one I tied with great care. That's what I call a display fly. And I might have spent more than an hour tying that fly. But we're not going to do that now. <laughs> These are flies. This is going to be a fly to be fished. So it's not going to be anywhere near perfect. And that's all right. Get my hook in there. That's the way I like it. I like that point sticking out a little bit. Because if I try to hide the point, it just gets clumsy to try to get access to the hook. Start my thread right up about an eye length short of the eye. That leaves room for the thread head. Wrap back tightly over the end about as far as you want your hackle to go. Now this is a royal wolf. It's a fast water fly so I'm going to use all that space for hackle. This is not a fly for flat water. I mean it Certainly people do that kind of thing, but that's not the original design at all. And uh, snap off the end. What I do is take a few extra turns in one place, hold the bobbin down, and snap the thread quickly forward, and off it comes. So now I'll wrap back to about just short of the center of that first layer of thread. About there. Now, I have decided that for a wing I'm going to use calf tail and I'll uh, that's one of your options and I'll take some calf tail it takes more than you would think <laughs> mm, there cut that off and then I think you're I really think you need to do this I know I do. Let's take a comb, any comb. This is just an old junky hair comb. And then comb out the butts. You get all these short fibers you don't want in there. Now, put those tips first into your hair stacker. Get all the tips in, which is a little tricky. Because, you know, this this is uh, this is calf tail and it it's kind of cranky stuff. You look at the tips on calf tail and they're wavy, even kinky. And so they don't like to separate out nice as, as easily as a straight hair would. So instead of doing this for all the time it would take, I'm going to cheat and I'm going to grab this identical hair stacker that I could have lied to you. I could have said that's all the time it takes, but <laughs> that's not true. It takes a while to get calf tail to settle down and, and even out. So I've already tapped this one before we even started. There you go. Now, get in there, be deliberate. There's your calf tail, there's your wings. Now if you don't like any of the hairs, if there's any that stick out way further than the other ones, look a little weird, you can pull them out. Depends on how persnickety you are. Your fish generally are not anywhere near as persnickety as a fly fisherman, I can tell you that. Now, how long should you make the wing? Here's my formula for a standard dry fly. And a, the Royal Wolf is a standard dry fly as far as I'm concerned. Here's the far edge of the eye, the tip of the eye, right? Here's the far edge of the bend. Here's where the shank ends. Now, for a wing, I like to go from the tip of the eye, the far edge of the eye, to the center of the bend. So that would be about like that. And I'm going to Put the wing up there. Okay, I've got to move it around in my hand a little, but I'm going to, again, be deliberate. Get the ends up here with, with the eye, and then I've got my thumbnail right on the spot. Without blinking, without looking away, without getting distracted, I'm going to put that thumbnail right where the thread's hanging. Tug the thread back between my thumb and the material. Go down the other side. There's no real thread tension here. And tug it back between my finger and the material. Now I've got a loop of thread and the material and the hook between my thumb and finger. And I roll the joints forward to really enclose all that. Pull the thread down firmly. And then pull back on it before I release everything. And there's my material right on top. That's called 
the pinch. And years ago, when I when I was working on flight time made clear and simple, I thought I might have invented that term, and then I looked around and I found that <laughs> nope, Dick Tiller had already called it that. So he did it a little differently than I did, but not much. And he said it first, not by much either, but he did. Okay, so the wings are tied on, bound down quite a ways, and now I'm going to cut them. But the trick is here, cut them at a fairly steep angle. Well, not steep, actually, a long angle is what I meant to say. Because if you cut them at a short angle, a steep angle, which I didn't mean to say at first, then the hair is, the, the thread's going to keep dropping off this little shelf. But if you have a, a fairly long angle, that won't happen. So now, if I use plenty of thread tension when I wrap down over this, this is going to happen. The, the, the fibers are going to escape and, and it's going to be a problem. But if I use light thread tension going back, I can bind and control the fibers. Then when I go forward, I can use heavy thread tension and I'm in. So that works great. Now I go back to here. Time for the tail. For the tail, I'm going to use the center brown, natural brown of a bucktail. This happens to be a dyed brown bucktail. So I can just use these fibers. And I'll cut a bunch off for the tail. And then same thing, really. I uh, comb out the butts. And then I'm going to cheat again because I've already got some hair that's really pretty well stacked and so <laughs> I'm just doing this so that you don't have to sit there and listen to me tap forever on a hair stacker. Somebody's going to invent a hair stacker that works automatically but I don't know of one yet so you just tap it like that you keep tapping or you can tap it on a surface of course you know that'll really annoy other people in the same room Sometimes I like to do that. And then again, when you take the cap off, you've got your hair all stacked. Be deliberate about grabbing it. I'm going to turn it around. And now I go in, grab the hair, and I've got my tails. Okay. Now, how long should the tail be? Here's what I think. <laughs> And you can finish off the wing before you do the tail, or you can finish off the wings after you do the tail. That's up to you. I like the tail to be the full length of the hook, from the tip of the eye to the tip of the bend, right there. So I will measure that point. And let's see. Looks good right there. So I grab that point, put that point exactly over the bend, where the bend starts, in other words, the bend of the hook begins. And the reason I didn't put it up where the thread is, because then I would have too short a tail. I'm trying to measure the length of the tail where it emerges from the bend, and so that's where I measured it. And that looks pretty darn good. I think that's just about right. So now that's bound on. I can lift that up, and I also cut that at a long angle. Let's see, I don't like that. Go this way. And see, I'm not cutting it bluntly. I'm cutting it so it, so it's a taper. And now everything's smooth. There's a smooth taper here because of the blending of the butts of the two types of hair. Okay, pull this back. Get in there with your thumbnail and really crease it upright. Then hold all that back. Get your thread up there. And I'm a little suspicious of this wing. I, I, I want to be honest with you and tell you the things I like and don't like about this fly. I, first of all, I don't like that some of these shorter fibers are getting in my way. I really don't like that. I thought I got rid of them all, but they are pesky. <laughs> and so I'm really building up the thread to try to make those stand up. And there you go. They're up. Okay, now how do you divide the wings evenly? Best way I know is this. Look straight down the front of the wings. And you can take a bodkin or your closed scissor blades and just get your head down there and look right down the center and then push your scissors down the middle. And that should give you 
evenly divided wings that are divided neatly right in the center. And you give those a good pull and they'll pretty much stay out to the sides. Now, get back to where I was. I'm going to turn the, the, the vise so that you can see what I'm doing on top here. So, viewed from the top, I bring the thread forward and between the wings, and then I do not the, not the near wing, but the far wing first, and I bring the thread around a couple of times, basically to gather that wing nice and neatly. Now I go back with the thread, and you don't need to turn the, the vise, a lot of them don't turn, but I'm doing this so you can see what I'm doing, and then I pull back on the thread, I'm pulling back this way. And then, that's almost too much. <laughs> and then I take a few turns. And now the thread is going uh, the opposite of the normal direction. It's going toward me over the top and away from me over the, over, over, under the bottom. But that's all right. Because, in fact, that's exactly what we want. Because now I go between the wings again and I catch the near wing. And I go around it twice. Twice is a good number. You can use just go once or you can go more if you wish. And then I go back and now, guess what? The thread is winding in the usual direction again. And I pull back till I get that wing where I want it. And now it's under tension and I wrap over the thread. And the wing is set. Okay, there are my two wings. Set upright and divided neatly into two even pairs. Okay, it's time for the body. So I'm going to go back. And see the nice taper here? That really works out well. That's just a matter of putting one set of long angle cut butts over another set of long angle cut butts, exactly as I did. And now I need Peacock. Here's a ratty old one. Uh, Carol wouldn't let me cut up her nice pretty one that I showed you earlier. She confiscated that. But this ratty one still has some good fibers on it. I wouldn't mind a little bushier fibers for a, a fly that's this, uh, you know, a size 10 like this. But, but this is what I have, and it'll look fine. So I'll take, yeah, let's say three of these. And the tips are quite fragile. They'll, they're going to drive me nuts. So the way to keep the tips from dry... <laughs> Cat in the lap. Go on, Olive. Sorry. Bad time. Go on, go on, go on. Okay, fine. Um, so I cut off those tips and then they're not going to bother me. They're not going to irritate me the way this cat is. Look, I love you, but go. Okay, so there are the cut off tips. I just take a light turn of thread, very light tension, and then pull it tight. And now they're bound. And this is such pretty stuff. Look at that. That's amazing stuff. It's, it's really no wonder that fly tires have always loved Peacock Girl. It's just gorgeous. All right, so now I take a few turns of the peacock curl around the thread, and then I'm going to grab the actual bobbin and spin the peacock curl and the bobbin together. Another way to do this is just to reach up here if you can do it. Sometimes the peacock curl doesn't want to spin on the thread very well, and then if you use the bobbin to help spin it, it works better. So I'll just for now, I'll just grab the bobbin, spin the peacock and the bobbin as, as a pair. So why am I doing this instead of just wrapping the peacock? Well, you can wrap the peacock, but I like a really durable fly. And peacock is not really durable. But when it's got the thread reinforcing it, then it becomes much more durable. So now I'll wrap that around in a few turns just to make a little uh, hurl butt on there. That's probably about right. I'm going to separate out the peacock. It kind of unwinds on its own if you give it half a chance. And then bind that, draw it forward, bind it with the thread. And then you've got to kind of pace yourself here because if you, or in this case, if I, um, yeah, that's good. If I make the body too long, I'm not going to have room for enough hackle. If I make the body too short, I'm going to have too much room for hackle, and I don't want too much room. Because then, I, then I'm going to get a weird looking fly. 
Okay, so here's the floss. This is a spool of single strand floss. And I cut some off. And then again, let's see. So now I'll take this floss and just take a light turn around it. Slide it back if you don't want to mess with cutting the end. And then uh, just bind the floss back to the hurl. And even a little bit into the hurl if you wish. And some people will wind the floss back and then forward again. And you can do that. It'll build up the body more. But I always worry about that floss sliding when it's not bound at both ends. So this is the way I prefer to do it. And floss is interesting. You, it kind of tends to spread on its own if you don't want it to. Not if you want it to, then it won't. But um, it's kind of cranky stuff, so it takes a little getting used to. I'm pretty used to it. And so that's enough. I, I've made the body over long. And the reason I've made it a little bit over long is because I can just put the hurl over the body. If I make the body too short, then, you know, then it just is too short. There's nothing I can do. Okay, trim off the floss. And then, here we go again. I'll use three of these. Again, trim off the tips that are too fine and too fragile. Use a light turn of thread over them and then bind them on. This is a good time to stop and take stock. How much room do I want for the hackle? That's not bad, actually. But that's how much I'll have... <laughs> that's how much I'd have if that were the end of the body, but it's not if I don't keep wrapping back. So I'll wrap back a little further. I'll try there. Okay. Yep, nope, I, I gotta get back. I gotta have the thread back there with it. Okay, so, again... Spin. You start. Usually, I start by doing it by hand. That gets it started. And then I spin the bobbin and the hurl together until I get it pretty well spun on there. And then try to lose that spin and just make a second rough of peacock curl. That's looking pretty good. Now this rough of peacock curl, I'm just going to tie the hurl off, bind it off, and then cut it. This is an awkward way to do it, but that looks good. I'll do that for one hackle and then strip everything below it. And this is the thing about fly tying, you know, you end up throwing away more than you use a lot of times. And then honestly, I don't like that aspect of it, but that is just a fact of life. If you don't do that, you end up with crummy flies. So, you know, I don't want to use these webby fibers down here. I want to get away from those. So, looks about right. It's just a little bit of a webby hackle anyway, but it will work. So I strip this one as well. And now, I'm back here in front of the wings. Be aggressive. If, you, if the materials are calling the shots, then things aren't going to go too well. I like the dull side. That's the dull side. It's also the concave side. I like that facing back. So I like the shiny side forward. That means I'm going to put this hackle on here like this. Take a turn, pull it, and now the hackle is on its edge. Any dry fly hackle is going to wrap better if it starts out on its edge because, you know, it, it's supposed to wrap on its edge, and if it starts out on its side, it's going to be hard to get it to ride up on its edge. But if it starts on its edge, it's going to tend to just keep, keep going that way. So now I've got my two hackles bound in. I'll bind slowly, or thoroughly, tightly over the over the butts of the hackle. Now what, what you could do is to try not to get a blunt end or too much of a taper in front of the wings is cut one of these off right next to the wings without cutting the wings. <laughs> I did it. 
and then bring the other one forward and then the, the thing I said about about uh, cutting at an angle that even applies to something as fine as the stem if I cut this straight across I'm gonna have that little blunt stem and it's gonna cause problems but if I cut it at a long angle not so much okay again wings out of the way here's a great invention the English hackle pliers I love them and that's because I use them most of <laughs> at least half the time I'm using them I'm not using them for anything that has to do with hackle they're really handy but they're also great for hackle so the wings are forward out of the way and I start wrapping the first hackle and each turn I take I'm going to make leave a little slot now it's a really thin slot. It's about the width of the stem of the hackle. And so when I wrap the second hackle, it will have a place to go. It will drop into that slot. That's exactly what you want. And now the stem's getting thinner, so I can make the turns a little closer. Don't crowd the eye of the hook. When you get up here about where you're supposed to stop, do stop. Try to get your turns of thread over the stem, not so much the hackle fibers if you can avoid them. You can wait to cut that off, but I'll cut it off now. Grab your hackle tip, get a good grip of the tip. You don't need all that up in the fly. You don't want it in the fly, really. So why, uh, you know... Why well, start out with it there? Get the wings out of the way. Let's see if I can get these boys to behave. I'll pull a fast one on them. Yeah, <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Now it's going to keep. If I keep about the same angle of the hackle as I wind it forward, the same angle as the first hackle, then the second hackle will just naturally drop into those slots that I left, and I'll have a nice, neat hackle. That's not bad. It could be neater, yes, yes, but that's not bad. Okay, again, trying to get in there and just get the stem if I can. And then watch it, because wouldn't it be just great now if I cut the thread? I'd have to find two more hackles. So I cut closely. And then I make the triangle. That's what I've always called it. That one I actually think I did name, though I'm sure I wasn't the first to use it. But I'll get my first, second, and third finger together like that, the tips, and there's a sort of a triangular space in the center. I go over the eye of the hook, let the thread pass, and try not to stab myself, of course. That would be good. And then I've got all the materials pulled back, and that allows me, makes it easy to build the thread head. Except that I did get a hackle in there that I'm not pleased about one bit. There. And so just a small thread head is fine. Pull out some thread. Make a whip finish. You can use a whip finish finishing tool if you like to. I learned to tie before there was such thing as a whip finishing tool. And then I was a, a, a commercial fly tire doing orders of 100 dozen at a time and one size of one fly and you learn real fast that any unnecessary tool is a problem because it costs you time. For the commercial tire, the production tire, speed, efficiency is everything. Now I got a couple of uh, fibers in there that I do not like. If I can't get them out of there, that's life. Uh -huh. Fine, fine. Ah, got it. Okay, so then, you know, as, as I said, you got to be a little rough with your materials, so when you're done, you can straighten them out, and if they're good materials, they, they'll be fine. You won't hurt them a bit. And there we go. That is Lee Wolf's Royal Wolf. And next, I'm going to tell you when to fish it, where to fish it, and how to fish it.
So when, how, and where do you fish the royal wolf? Um, I can tell you where. <laughs> it's really a fast water fly. It's bushy, it's got hair, wings, and tail. And fast water, broken water, they tend to be the same thing. Uh, you can find that in headwater streams all over North America. And in the West, I mean, it's kind of everywhere. You find lots of fast-moving streams and broken streams, real bouldery rivers. Great place to fish the royal wolf. Now, this is not a hatch fly. This does not imitate an insect. In fact, it does just the opposite. It's a crazy kind of fly that attracts curiosity more than anything, but works. And it's a really good attractor fly. Fish it dead drift, that is, use slack line casts and such, so that it drifts along naturally as though it's not even attached to a leader or a tippet. So, if you didn't before, by now, you recognize this as the royal wolf. We just tied it, of course. And uh, how did that fly evolve? It's actually got a pretty interesting history. First, there was the royal coachman. And that's this one right here. It came from England. It's uh, what they called a fancy fly. We now call that an attractor fly. It doesn't imitate anything, but it works. That's what an attractor is. It's unnatural, but it works. So the Royal Coachman was so popular when I was a kid that, holy cow, I mean, there, there, were, there was a Royal Coachman Bucktail and a Fan Wing Royal Coachman and a California Coachman and on and on. If you used the word Royal or Coachman in a fly name, it was going to, you know, be a hit. And this is uh, one of those flies right there. That's the uh, Royal Trude. And uh, so decades ago, a man named Lee Wolf came up with uh, his wolf series of flies. And the idea was he wanted to make dry flies that, unlike the old royal coachman, were kind of heavily dressed and had heavier hackles, but also had hair wings, hair tail, so that they'd be easier to see, so that they'd float longer and better. And so he came up with the royal wolf. But he also came up with a whole bunch of others. The wolf series includes this one, the white wolf, but also the gray wolf and the... Uh, Blonde Wolf, and I, I can't remember them all, but there's a bunch of them. And eventually the Royal Wolf kind of won out. It's, it's really the most popular of the bunch. There's Lee Wolf, creator of the Royal Wolf and the whole Wolf series of dry flies. Um, Lee is gone now, but he, he was a character. And uh, he was always kind of trying to stir things up. I mean, he, uh, you know, he'd go out and catch some big, big fish on a tiny rod or something, either just to prove he could do it or to see if he could do it or, or just to get a little attention. But uh, he was an innovator, uh, not just his wolf series, but he really had an effect on fly fishing. <laughs> ¶¶